this week at Starbase. SpaceX has been hard at work ahead of their next integrated flight test. Booster 14 is tested, Ship 35 continues construction, and Starbase is now officially Starbase? All that and a whole lot more coming at you. Now let's dig into this week's update. Last Friday morning began with the ship's static fire test stand arriving at the build site before stopping in the ring yard. Booster 14 was lifted off the transport stand and set down on the orbital launch mount for static fire testing. Once the booster was in place, the chopsticks were set down and the ship quick disconnect arm was swung in. The booster transport was driven out of the launch site, but it didn't go far, stopping off inside the car park next to the Starhopper. Shortly before midnight and continuing into Saturday morning, crews began adding a yellow boom extension to the build site crawler crane. The propellant tank farm was activated a few hours later after that and began loading Booster 14 with propellants. The methane tank was given a partial fill, while the liquid oxygen tank was given a full load. In a static fire test, this is to make sure the booster is too heavy to lift off the pad. While testing was underway, an assembly that looks like a strainer of some kind passed by. If y'all know what this thing might be, let us know what you think in the comments below. After about 40 minutes of fueling, the detonation suppression system was activated and the 33 Raptors spun up their turbo pumps a few seconds later. With that, the booster completed its spin prime test and was ready to be detanked. A ring load spreader was brought out of storage at Sanchez and was taken over to High Bay. This was followed by Starship's 35 payload bay, which was brought into High Bay from Star Factory. The empty ring stand was then sent back to Star Factory. SpaceX hosted its second annual A Christmas Drone Story show on South Padre Island as the sky was lit up with hundreds of choreographed drones. A telescopic lift and launch mount work platform were brought back to the launch pad in the evening. Scaffold mounting points were affixed to Booster 14 on Sunday morning. The hardware was installed just below Booster 14's common dome. While low clouds set in at the launch site, the work platform was brought over to the orbital launch mount. Work under the booster was finished a few hours later. The platform was then removed from the launch mount and sent to the car park next to Starhopper. Back at the build site, a booster ring load spreader was brought out of Mega Bay 1 and taken to Sanchez. After the PA system at the launch pad announced loud checkouts for the booster, the vehicle's engine igniters were tested. After several months of construction, contractors put the finishing touches on the roadside facade of the office and star factory. Although the exterior is finished, there's quite a bit of work left to do inside, which will be in progress for some weeks to come. Outside the launch site, workers began setting up traffic cones opposite the D2 gate, making sure the way is clear for the arrival of a new storage tank. The new tank arrived at Starbase on Monday morning, carried on a towed self-propelled modular transporter unit. The oversized load made its way down Highway 4, heading straight for the launch site. Once the tank arrived, it was carefully maneuvered through the D2 gate and work began to unload the tank from the SPMT. With a static fire test scheduled, the new tank was moved towards Pad B and out of harm's way. As the sun began to rise over Starbase, the Pad A tower's arms were raised to the launch position. Mirroring the preparations for the spin prime test, Booster 14 was loaded with cryogenic propellants, taking about 40 minutes to fully load the vehicle. As the pre-flight countdown neared zero, several employees came out to Star Factory to watch the test. With engine ignition imminent, the water deluge system activated. The 33 Raptor engines then came roaring to life, burning for a little under 10 seconds and filling the launch site with an enormous plume of steam and dust before shutting down. With the static fire test now complete, the booster was ready to move on to the last parts of the pre-launch process flow. Once Booster 14 was safed and the pad reopened, the new tank was moved into place, setting down next to another tank at the tank farm. 
Buckner's LR-11000 was moved away from Pad 2 and began heading towards the propellant storage farm to help move smaller tanks into place. A single ring section, which seems to be a production reject, was brought out of Star Factory and headed off to the scrapyard. Buckner's LR-11000 eventually arrived near the front entrance. Since it's usually so far away from the road, it's easy to forget just how large this crane is. Over at the fabrication yard at Sanchez, parts for the Massey test site flame trench were moved. The Buckner crane continued maneuvering around the front entrance before making its way to the staging area near the propellant unloading docks. The crane's great size made this slow going, taking most of the evening to make the trip. One of the shorter horizontal tanks stored at Sanchez began to move a bit ahead of relocation to the orbital tank farm. The platform for working under the orbital launch mount was brought back to the launch site and was taken to Pad A for setup under Booster 14. With testing complete on Booster 14 now, the transport stand was brought back to the launch complex and taken towards the mount area as work began to take the rocket back to the build site. The first of the cryo storage tanks at Sanchez began its journey to the launch site, passing through the ring yard to get onto Highway 4. A larger horizontal tank, the second new one of these this week, passed by shortly after, rolling into Starbase along Highway 4 and following the other tank to the launch pad in the reduced traffic of a quiet night. When the tanks reached the launch complex, the smaller tank continued on towards the Buckner crane at the site of the former vertical storage tanks, while the newly arrived larger tank pulled into the D2 gate. The shorter tank was quickly steered off the highway and positioned in front of the Buckner crane for installation. The longer tank was moved around to make space. With multiple new tanks and limited room, some repositioning was needed. The SPMT segment of the transport for the longer tank was backed out of the D2 gate, taking the turn slowly in the limited space outside. Once the transport was turned around, it was reattached to the tractor and departed Starbase. Over at Tower 1, the chopsticks were lowered down to the hard stop before being raised back up to the lifting position around Booster 14. The Buckner crane needed to leave the counterweight tray behind during its move. Another crane loaded the tray onto a transporter, which began a quick trip out to the launch site to join the crane at the orbital tank farm. With preparations now complete, Booster 14 was slowly lifted off the orbital launch mount and was carefully swung over before being set down on the booster transport stand. A new vaporizer was brought to the launch complex, coming in through the D2 gate and set down near the horizontal storage tank. While the sun rose over Starbase, workers around the Buckner crane prepared to install the first of the new storage tanks. Over at the second launch pad, a concrete pumper was pouring concrete into the base of the tower. Once the booster was secured to the transport stand, Booster 14 began its return trip to the build site, heading up Highway 4 before turning into the main entrance in front of the ring yard. Once inside the factory grounds, the booster and transport set up in front of Mega Bay 1 and workers began to attach scaffolding to the fixtures around the common dome. Back to the launch complex at the propellant farm, the Buckner crane crews began securing a load spreader to the new methane tank for installation. Counterweights were pulled off the SPMT and loaded onto the crane as they adjusted the crane for the weight of the tank. Meanwhile, at the build site, a faint reflection of Ship 35's nose cone being mated to the payload bay section inside High Bay could be seen on the glass outside of Star Factory. After spending several hours in the ring yard, Booster 14 was eventually moved into Mega Bay 1. Temporary fencing was set up for groundwork just inside the launch site D2 gate, blocking off half of the road inside. Early on Wednesday morning, the ship static fire stand was taken from its parking spot in the ring yard and brought into Mega Bay 2. Back at the launch complex, a concrete pumper set up to pour more concrete. Starship 33 was rolled out to Massey's test site for cryogenic and static fire testing. Starship 33 is the first Block 2 Starship and has quite a few changes compared to the Block 1 ships. Forward flaps were redesigned and moved leeward, and according to Elon Musk, this makes them lighter, better protected against re-entry, and easier to manufacture. 
The raceway was split in two, with electrical and eulage volume gas now split between the two raceways. The Starlink antennas have also been repositioned, with two antennas inside the heat shield envelope and two in the center of the leeward side of the ship. The ship's length was also increased by one ring overall, and the propellant tanks were lengthened significantly at the cost of reducing the size of the payload bay. A front-end loader was brought to the launch site, giving workers more heavy earth-moving equipment to work with while digging out the flame trench. A ring stand was brought into High Bay to take the front section of Ship 35 out of the building. At the orbital tank farm, the Buckner crane briefly began to lift the methane tank before halting the lift and setting it back down. A second successful attempt began a bit over an hour later, with the tank successfully being installed in the former vertical tank area. While the tank lift was underway, the ship quick disconnect arm was swung out from the tower and the chopstick arms were raised to the top. Several chopstick catch tests were performed throughout the remainder of the evening, simulating various catch situations at the tower. Just a couple of days ago, the paperwork for incorporating Starbase as a Type C municipality with Cameron County was announced by Judge Eddie Trevino Jr. There's a lot of paperwork to go through yet, but when the court filing is all in place, an election will be held by the residents to decide if they want to incorporate Starbase as a full-fledged city. If the vote is passed and the election is ratified, Starbase will be incorporated as the newest city in Texas. The stacked nose cone and payload bay assembly was brought out of High Bay and taken into the Star Factory, where it will be outfitted with additional hardware. The open halls and glass walls gave an excellent view of the ship as it moved further into the building. The second of the shorter horizontal tanks from Sanchez was delivered to the orbital tank farm on Thursday morning, passing by the launch site entrance as it made its way over to the Buckner Crane. A vertical tank was delivered to the launch complex on an SPMT, which was quickly offloaded. The transport was then backed out of the complex and joined to an awaiting semi-truck before leaving the Starbase area. Making use of one of the smaller cranes, the recently delivered vaporizer was installed near the new horizontal tanks. The second of the shorter horizontal tanks was installed by the Buckner crane later that morning. The tank was soon set on its foundations for workers to begin anchoring it in place. An unfamiliar white ring was picked up and moved around Sanchez. This device looks about the same size as a Starship hull. Let me know what you think in the comments if you know what it is. Over at the build site, another single ring section was taken out of Star Factory and sent off for scrapping. Two SPMTs, one loaded with several counterweights and one empty, were moved away from the Buckner crane and went inside the launch complex through the D2 gate. The Buckner crane was then repositioned in front of the orbital propellant farm, putting it in a good spot for installing new equipment. Another single ring segment was taken out of Star Factory and also sent off to the scrapping area. The second of the recently delivered longer horizontal tanks at the launch site was repositioned, keeping it out of the way while work continues elsewhere. This week at the Cape, Friday saw Falcon 9 Booster 1067 lift off of a short fall of Gravitas and set down at the docks. Signet Warhorse 1 towed a short fall of Gravitas back out to sea just three hours later to support the Starlink Group 12-5 mission. Adjusting to SpaceX's ever-changing plans, crews began scrapping the liquid oxygen tank at historic launch complex 39A. SpaceX's support ship Bob returned to port on Saturday, carrying both fairing halves from the Sirius SXM-9 launch on the 5th. Signet Warhorse 3 returned with just read the instructions and booster 1076 from the Sirius launch a few hours later. A two-crane tandem lift was used to remove the upper dome of the liquid oxygen tank shell. This tank will probably be replaced with the commodity storage tanks, similar to those seen at Starbase. Twelve minutes after midnight on Sunday, Starlink Group 12-5 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 on Booster 1086. Dockside crews had managed to clear the backlog of return boosters, with Booster 1067 returning to Roberts Road, clearing the way for Booster 1076. 
SpaceX support ship Doug returned to port with both fairing halves from the Starlink Group 12-5 launch. Booster 1076 was then moved onto the dockside stand a few minutes later for stowage. Signet Warhorse 1 brought a shortfall of Gravitas back to port on Tuesday, taking Booster 1086 to the dockside stand for unloading. The Falcon 9 was soon unloaded and set down on the docks. Smoke billowed from the liquid oxygen tank as crews cut through the outer shell with a plasma cutter while a crane supports the weight of the cutoff tank section. A few hours later, the shell segment was lifted off of the rest of the tank. Falcon 9 Booster 1076 wrapped up its stay at the dockside stand on Wednesday and was lowered down to an awaiting transporter for its return to Roberts Road. Demolition crews were quickly working through the tank shell at Launch Complex 39A, leaving just enough to keep standing while the crane remained detached. Signet Warhorse 1 towed a shortfall of Gravitas out to sea ahead of the GPS 310 launch. This satellite, nicknamed Hedy Lamar after the famous Hollywood actress, had been held in reserve and was originally planned to launch in 2026. A Saren CC-8800, likely the same one that was working at Starbase, was raised up right to work on the assembly of the second mobile launcher for the Space Launch System. SpaceX support ship Doug then headed out of Port Canaveral in support of the GPS-310 launch. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.